Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to today's online Clava session. My name is Ian Rees, and I'm chair of Clava, the Welsh People's History Society. Many thanks for joining us today. Many of you will already have participated in one or more of our online events, all of which have been recorded and can be found on the Clava website. These events have covered diverse topics and have taken a variety of formats. But today's event, today's event is a first for Clava as we are pleased to present our first online book launch. The new publication in question is Swansea Copper, A Global History, and we're delighted that its co-authors Chris Evans and Louise Miskell are here to talk about their work today. Before we get underway, please could everyone uh, ensure that they turn off their cameras and mute their devices. Thank you. I'm going to uh, hand over now to Professor Martin Johns of Swansea University, who is going to chair today's discussion. Martin has lectured in history at Swansea since 2006, as is, and himself has had a number of acclaimed history books and articles published, including more recently, Wales, England's Colony, question mark, which has gone to reprint and which was made into an excellent two-part documentary uh, for BBC Wales with Martin himself presenting. Martin, a very warm welcome and over to you. Uh, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to the session. Um, English historians masquerading as British historians, maybe, sometimes say that Welsh history is parochial. Perhaps sometimes it is, but that charge can't be levelled against this book. Swansea Copper, a global history, is remarkable for the depth and the breadth, especially, of its research. It shows the limitations of, of looking at industries in local and national contexts, when people, capital, materials and ideas traverse the globe. No one who reads this book can think that globalisation is a recent development. It's written by two historians who combine being excellent scholars with lovely people, a combination that anybody familiar with universities will know doesn't always go together. Um, Chris of the University of South Wales is probably best known for his book Slave Wales, a punchy study that shows how deeply Welsh people and the Welsh economy were entwined with Atlantic slavery. In recent months, it's had a really significant impact on public debate around the legacy and relevance of history for present day society. Louise, a colleague of mine at Swansea University, her career started in urban history and anyone interested in the history of Welsh towns and their intellectual culture should read her book, Intelligent Town, a study of Swansea in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Like Chris, her research is also relevant for understanding the intersections of the past and the present her ongoing work on deindustrialization and the history of steel in Port Albert has involved community groups, schools, and Tata Steel, the Indian owners of Port Albert Steelworks, itself another reminder of the importance of global dimensions to understanding the Welsh economy. Um, the theme essentially that's at the heart of this book and we're gonna to discuss today. Um, just to warn you all that the session is being um, recorded. You can comment throughout um, and we encourage you to do so on anything the speakers say um, using the chat function. Please, please do feel free to use that. Um, there will be time for kind of questions and answers um, at the end. So perhaps we can kind of kick off by asking what's maybe a rather obvious question, um, but nonetheless, it's a really important one. Why did you write this book? Well, thank you, Martin. Um, and I'm going to... Uh pitch in first, if I may, Chris. Um, I'd like to start just by saying that you kindly mentioned my History of Swansea, which was published in 2006. Um, and I got interested in copper as part of that study. Um, and then the following year in 2007, um, Hugh Bowen was appointed Professor of Modern History at Swansea, historian of the East India Company, as many will know, very interested in global trade. And he was somebody who really encouraged me to take the story of copper a bit further. And I think the other encouragement I had um, down this route also came from Swansea, which um, was from the Richard Burton Archives, the um, repository of historic records for the South Wales copper industry. So they've got a wealth of material and they were really encouraging uh, around the idea of using that to, to try and tell a sort of bigger story. Because I think 
There have been previous studies of copper, um, but most of them have focused on the impact on Swansea itself. And I think, um, you know, what we wanted to do really was to try and broaden that. Um, and as you've said, tell a story that was much more international. Well, I suppose my, my involvement comes from a, a really different direction, as you mentioned, Martin, at the outset. I mean, these days I principally trade as a historian of slavery, I guess. And I became aware of the existence of a gigantic copper mine that was operating in 19th century Cuba. And it became apparent to me that this mine at El Cobre, a town literally called Copper in eastern Cuba, was really a suburb of, Car of um, Swansea. It was a suburb in the sense that the mine was wholly owned by British capitalists and uh, prominent among them were Swansea Copper Masters, principally the Grenfell family. And that made me think about the role of the wider world in the history of, of Welsh industry. And I thought, here's a story worth telling. What you have is what in 1840 was probably the largest individual slave enterprise in the Western Hemisphere is existing purely at the behest of the Swansea copper industry. So that led me into looking at copper more widely. And I think both Louise and I benefited from the fact that there was a renewal over the last 10 years in scholarship about copper mining and copper smelting in Central and Northern Europe, led by Scandinavian scholars. So all of that kind of coincided in a way that made looking at Swansea something that demanded our attention and looking at it in a global context um, was just simply unavoidable. So I suppose that raises the question, which you've, you know, you started, why exactly is Swansea so, so important? Because in some ways it, it's really remarkable how, when I, as a child going to Swansea, I simply don't remember anything at all uh, about <laughs> the association between Swansea and Copper. It seems to have come into public consciousness from, from almost nowhere. So, so why is that? Why is Swansea so important to the copper industry? Well, there's lots of answers to that question. Um, I think um, for me, one of the most important things um, that made Swansea important was, was the sheer concentration of the industry in a very specific region. Um, you know, in the, by about 1823, there were already um, eight huge copper firms located on the banks of the River Towie. But as well as the, the Swansea Valley itself, the, the neighbouring sort of outlying districts as far west as Aberavon and as far, as far west as Slethley, as far east as Aberavon, also became um, centres of the copper industry. And, you know, that kind of concentration made the whole district, and we, we, when we talk about Swansea Copper, we're talking about that, that entire district, not just Swansea itself. Um, it made it really un unique in, in British terms. Um, and the reason for that concentration was a sort of um, a coincidence of geographical factors, really, uh, geographical locational advantages, which enabled Swansea to capitalise on the invention of new um, coal fired uh, technology for smelting copper. Um, prior to the early um, 18th century, most smelting, most metal smelting was done using wood fired technology. Um, but new furnace technology was invented, which meant you could use coal. And so some like Swansea, which was located on the South Wales coal field, but also on a coastal location, was really well positioned to take advantage of that. And, you know, it, it did so with astonishing success, really, I think in the 18th and early 19th century, especially. Um, and the survival of the industry, you know, in that region for around 200 years, you know, I think shows just how successfully they managed to um, position themselves as, as leaders in that sector. No, I think the, the factor of coal is absolutely fundamental here, as Lee, Louise has pointed out. Co Swansea, in many respects, is a really odd place in which to smelt copper, because throughout all of human history, we do one thing, we discover ore and we smelt ore where you find ore. 
because ore is a very dense material, metallic ores are very dense, they're, they're very difficult to transport. So you smelt them on the spot. Swansea is remarkable, probably perhaps unique um, in the way that it is a smelting center that has no ore, but what it does have is abundant coal and coal that lies adjacent to the sea. And that makes it possible to bring in ore from far, from far, far distances. In the 18th century, that was almost exclusively from Cornwall with a small Irish contribution. But in the 19th century, as I hinted earlier when speaking of Cuba, this is something that can go global. And ore is brought into copper, it brought into um, Swansea from all over the, the world to be processed by a, um, a technological procedure called the Welsh process. There is such a concentration of production using coal in Swansea that it really kind of defines a, an entire technology. Sad to say, actually, the Welsh process originated in England, but we won't probably sort of emphasise that too much. The important thing uh, about it, and the reason why it's called the Welsh process, it became so concentrated in the in the, the lower Swansea Valley and ad adjacent areas. So what you've got there is, because of coal, a situation where Swansea, and indeed Britain at large, goes from the complete periphery of European copper smelting. There's virtually no copper smelting in Britain in the, in the mid-17th century to being a really formidable international player by the middle of the 18th century. I think what's interesting as well, I mean, Chris and I have given talks on, on Swansea copper in lots of different places uh, over the last few years internationally, and we always have to sort of and spend a bit of time explaining that there isn't any copper ore in Swansea because people people always assume that the copper was being mined in Swansea because that's what was happening everywhere else really that was the kind of the usual model um so you know it's always the the sort of starting point really for for our explanations of Swansea copper that no no it was just the smelting that, that was happening and all the ore was being brought in from elsewhere but that of course is precisely what made it a global story um, so it, it was, it was just different and it, br it broke the model of the copper industry that had existed previously. Um, historians are always encouraged to kind of, to say their research is innovative, groundbreaking, um, et cetera. What, what, what would you say kind of makes your history um, different to what's been written before about Swansea Copper? Well, for me, I think, having just spoken about the importance of the technology, there's been an over-concentration on, the on the technology. And what we've tried to do is look not just on the production side, but on the consumption side. And for me, one of the key things as a historian of slavery was the role of the Caribbean in the rise of Swansea Copper. Because what the Caribbean and the sugar slave sector in the Caribbean represented was a simply gigantic injection of demand that allowed the, uh, the Swansea copper industry to grow. And this is visible in two ways. Copper is used on the West African coast for the acquisition of slaves. Um, copper is in high demand in, in West Africa, where there are relatively limited ore supplies. And copper is an absolutely indispensable material ingredient of sugar production in the in the West Indies. It's used in the making of, of sugar. Sugar is boiled in vessels that are called coppers for very good and obvious reasons. And copper is fundamental for the processing of um, byproducts of the sugar making process, i.e. molasses and turning that into rum. So there is a story here about the linkages between Britain and its kind of imperial possessions, its most precious imperial possessions in the, in the, uh, in the, in the West Indies. And I think what we also do is look at the contribution of copper to industrialization more, more widely. That's something that's often difficult to grasp because copper is often invisible. We think of some of the great kind of innovations of the 18th and 19th centuries, and um, they embody a huge amount of copper. 
a, a railway locomotive in the in the mid 19th century so one contemporary um, claimed embodied 10 tons of copper so there are enormous amounts of copper being consumed in the kind of new industrial processes um, that were springing up in Britain in textile production in transport networks you can spin that story out and out yeah I mean for me that's one of the the key things that we're doing in this book which which is a bit different I think you know as I as we've alluded to you know this isn't the first book about the copper industry um, in Swansea there have been some previous studies and you know, some of my predecessors at Swansea R.O. Roberts and his his research student um, uh, Robert Toomey have written lots about particular firms like Vivian uh, Vivian and Sons for example but I think you know, a lot, a lot of those were focusing on the impact of the industry on Swansea itself and looking at things like where ores were purchased from, um, how the, the works developed on the site in the Lower Swansea Valley. Um, we've tried to do a little bit more, I suppose, of sort of following the path of Swansea Copper when it leaves Swansea. Where does it end up? You know, and that is a surprisingly difficult question to answer because often, as Chris has pointed out you know it ends up inside things it ends up in a sort of a slightly invisible role in in machinery and in, in products that were part of industrialization and um you know one I, I spent some time up in um, Bangor researching the um records of um Williams and Grenfell one of the big firms that was working in Swansea and they have all these kind of product lists of what they were producing and it included um, items called Manchester rollers, which I came across. And so looking into this, you know, what these were, these were cylinders that were used for um, printing ink onto textiles. They were, they were sold to um, cotton firms and textile firms in the north of England um, during the, the big boom in copper textile production in the early 19th century. And, you know, that kind of link between copper and some of these other key industries of the Industrial Revolution, I think, is one of the one of the really important things that comes out of our book. I mean, you know, copper is not always invisible. You can sort of see it um, emerging in other kinds of products as well. And things like, um, you know, the development in, in shipbuilding technology and the the, um, the market for sheathing for copper as a sheathing material to cover the hulls of wooden ships to present, prevent them from corrosion. You know, that, that in a, from about the 1780s onwards provided a huge new market for um, copper, which, you know, the Swansea firms were sort of falling over themselves really to, to supply this huge new demand. So you can point to things like that, um, the Caribbean sugar industry that Chris talked about, um, the growth of sheathing um, and the link with other industrial sectors, locomotive building, textile production. Um, and it shows how intertwined, I think, the story of copper is with these other aspects of industrialization. Um, but, you know, it does make copper a, a difficult um, product to track because, of course, a lot of these products, you know, weren't actually being made in Swansea. The, the, the copper was being sold to other firms, manufacturing firms, who were making it elsewhere. So it's a it's a, a tricky trail to follow, but we've I think we've gone some way towards following in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think that's absolutely right. And what I would add is that when we say global, what we're trying to um, hint at is that Swansea wasn't the only game in town. And that's important to, to realise because very often you find things trotted out like in the 19th century, Swansea produced 90% of the world's copper. I mean, that's absolutely nonsense. Nowhere near that amount was produced in, in Swansea. What we have to see in Swansea is a really important node in a far wider network of production centres. Now, as I hinted earlier, recent scholarship on Central and Northern Europe indicates that the copper smelting sector in, in that part of the, the world was not stagnant, as many British authors assume. It was uh, resilient in the 18th century, growing in, in the 18th century. Even more important, though, is what's going on in East Asia. If we look at Swansea, there's an absolutely remarkable takeoff between the 1680s, say, and the American Revolution. 
Britain goes from, and we mean principally Swansea here, Britain goes from producing virtually no copper to producing 9,000 tonnes every year. Now, small beer by today's standards, of course, but it's a remarkable ascendancy. Um, Britain and Swansea in particular goes from being marginal to absolutely central. But if you take a look at what's happening in China, that ascendancy looks rather less remarkable. Uh, China has the same same kind of experience in China, and by China I mean here Yunnan province and Sichuan province on the southwest frontier of a growing empire, goes from producing very little copper to producing 10,000 tonnes every year. So in some sense the story of the, in the, of the 18th century isn't about Swansea, it's about Yunnan province in, in China. But no, understanding that um, I think gives a, a richer and deeper picture of what the Swansea contribution is and what the and what the Swan and what Swansea's importance is, it's part of this developing uh, global economy in copper, where rival centres as well as Swansea are growing in importance. There's simply more and more copper being produced in the world, and what Swansea represents is a very significant contribution to that and a technologically unique contribution to that. I mean, there's a whole load of questions coming through coming through in the chat, but but one thing a couple of people have brought up is to what, what extent would have the workers have been involved and um, been aware of themselves or been conscious that they were working in a in a global industry and in particular an industry that was linked in various ways to the slave trade. Difficult question to answer, of course, because we have very little first hand evidence. Um, a literature to do to do with copper workers or generated by copper workers themselves. So I'll, I'll, I might leave the 18th century for Louise to, Louise to answer because that's more her area of expertise. But I think in the 19th century, copper workers were well aware of themselves as part of a, a, a you know, a, being in, within a global context. And we know this because from the 1840s, something we might return to in a minute, Hundreds of them left Swansea to go to go overseas and to work in different parts of the world. So there was, by the 19th century, a quite sharp awareness of possibilities that lay beyond Southwest Wales. Yeah, I, I agree with Chris. I, I think um, that awareness would have been much more acute in the 19th century. But I, I, I suspect that some of the employees at Swansea's early copper works, places like White Rock, Clangavella, would have had a sense of the, the slave connections, for example, um, because they were manufacturing products that were very specifically for um, the slave market, particularly um, the, kind of the horseshoe items that were known as manilas, which were used um, by Bristol merchants trading um, in West Africa in exchange for slaves. Um, and they were being produced, um, we know, at Plangavellach and White Rock, in the early to mid 18th century. Um, so I suspect, you know, there would have been a sense that that was, that Bristol was a destination initially for some of these goods and that subsequently they were being shipped um, to West Africa. But I think, um, yeah, this, the international dimension was, was a, a very much a part of the consciousness of the workforces by the late 19th century. Um, and they, they knew um, about the expansion of the industry overseas. They were aware of opportunities for work. They were aware of the competition that was growing, um, that was putting pressure on um, the industry in Swansea. Um, and they, to some extent, used that as a lever to, to kind of protest and campaign for better paying conditions themselves. So it, it's certainly there. It's a current, I think, throughout um, this story. I mean, for me, what struck me as sort of unusual in, in your book or, you know, very admirable in your book, because other historians don't do this um, as much as maybe they should, is your ability to kind of shift from really big picture stuff, you know, global trades of pattern to localised kind of uh, kind of studies of what's actually happening in the works and what, you know, what conditions are like there. Um, and also who's influential, you know, where, who's, who's making the decisions, what's influencing, what's happening within specific works. Could you say a little bit more, and someone's asked that, this, the same question in the chat as well, what were conditions like in, 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 the, in the copper works in Swansea? What were they like as places? Yeah, 
Um, well, as places, I think they were vast. They were, uh, you know, the biggest works, you know, Havod, um, for example, um, multiple furnaces, um, you know, covering a, a kind of large acreage on the banks of the River Tawi. Um, there are some reports um, by contemporaries that a correspondent from the Morning Chronicle newspaper, London newspaper, visited um, the Swansea Copper Quarter in the early 1850s, um, talked to workers, described their appearance, um, and talked about the, the effect of working in the heat, working in proximity to quite toxic smoke. <laughs> I'm gonna mute myself for a second. Perhaps I can, I can, I can pick up that thread while Louise deals with the, emer the emergency. Um, Working in the Swansea copper industry was never a pleasant experience. It's a highly toxic process. Fundamentally, people who worked in the furnace halls were, were, were wading through a kind of a dry mist. Um, um, what do they call it in rock concerts? I, for, I forget. You said heavy metal bands used to do it a lot. You know, dry ice. Dry ice. That's that's the word. It, it's, it's like wading through dry ice. Um, unfortunately, the dry ice is made of sulfuric acid. And therefore, it is not a great working environment. Your skin is reddened and cracked. It's, uh, it's so potent that the, the so-called copper smoke um, actually erodes workers' teeth enamel. It's really, really damaging stuff. Therefore, this is a fundamentally unhealthy environment. And the, uh, the issuing of tons and tons of acid I mean, you know, tons and tons every day um, blights the entire area around the lower Swansea Valley and the Neath Valley, um, you know, destroying uh, vegetation and having a really damaging effect on, on livestock. So uh, copper the copper industry is something that produces a great deal of wealth, but it also blights the environment in a really, really fundamental way. So we need to be balanced in our appraisal of what the achievement of Swansea Copper was. On the other, on the one hand, it's a fantastic sort of technological achievement that uses the power of fossil fuels to really take the lid off the possibilities within the industry. But on the other hand, as we are acutely conscious today, the use of fossil fuels is, has, has come back to haunt us and has had kind of catastrophic effects on, uh, on climate change. What about labour relations? I mean, you started to talk about that. Are, they, are this, you know, should we think of this sort of as similar to the coal industry where there are fractious relations between capital and labour? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because um, I think, you know, often we've, we've assumed that the copper industry was different in that respect and that it, it had more tranquil labour relations. It was a smaller workforce. They were more highly skilled, they were better paid. Um, but I think as Chris and I have looked into this, that, that image is, doesn't really hold up to close scrutiny because what you see is that there actually was quite a large degree of um, differentiation of social status and of rates of pay amongst copper workers. You know, when you say, when you talk about copper workers, you're talking about a very big spectrum of different kinds of people and different kinds of work. You know, you might be talking about people who, who tended furnaces and were involved in the smelting process, but you're also talking about people who worked, you know, on the manufacturing side in the mills where they were making the copper sheathing and the, the other goods that we were talking about earlier. And rates of pay and, and status were very different um, depending on where, where you were in, in that hierarchy. And I think certainly by the second half of the 19th century, there were increasing um, expressions of discontent from different sections of that workforce around all sorts of issues and, and some of them similar kinds of issues that were cropping up in other industries. And there are lots of examples for, um, for, for one instance um, of protests about, you know, being paid piece rate work, you know, where you, you know, you, your salary depends on the amount of copper you could produce in a particular shift. Um, and often where, you know, the difficulties of smelting 
different kinds of ores, working with unpredictable raw materials. It could make it really difficult to secure a, a kind of living wage on a, on a piece rate like that. Um, so, the, you know, I think what we've started to do in this book is to um, unpick that, that perhaps um, inaccurate image of Swansea copper workers as being sort of sitting outside the normal um, patterns of industrial relations, because they, they certainly were um, in conflict with um, the owners of firms um, on, a, on a fairly regular basis, I would say. I think that's that's absolutely right. What we need to appreciate in all of this is that when we talk of the Welsh process, we should not assume that it's something stable. The, the, the Welsh process is a thing that shifts over time. And if we compare furnace sizes from the late 17th century to the mid 19th century, we find really, really dramatic changes. The earliest furnaces had a, um, a, 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 a kind of area, the hearth area was about nine square feet. By the time of the mid 19th century, a reverberatory furnace would have a hearth area of um, a furnace bowl area, I should say, of 109 square feet. So there's a massive escalation in size, and that means a massive escalation in workloads. And that is something that really um, compromises relations between capital and labor in the, in, the, in the industry because the industry is growing so rapidly, because there's a bulking up of the, the essential unit of, of production, there's ample scope for discord. And in the 1840s, that really boils over into a dramatic strike in, 18, in 1843, which brings the entire industry to a halt. And that has consequences. It's a victory for the employers. They're able to crush worker resistance at a time of kind of acute social disturbance across South Wales as a, as a whole in the, 18, in the 1840s. But it's in many ways a pyrrhic victory, because what happens in the 1840s is that copper workers start to emigrate to areas of the world where the Welsh process is being introduced and where they can find better wages. So by the mid 18th, by 1845, there are copper works on the Welsh pattern being opened at Baltimore in the United States. By 1847, the first migrant copper workers are leaving for Australia, for the, uh, the mining frontier of South Australia. And um, by, the same, by the same period, migrants are going to Chile, to the Chile's Norte Chico, the northern region of Chile, where copper ore is abundant and new Welsh-style factories are being opened up. So uh, the employer's victory in the kind of industrial turmoil of the 1840s is something that adds a new global dimension to the story of Swansea Copper by globalising the workforce. There's been a few questions about the, the employers themselves and who they were, how did they think of themselves? Did they see themselves as Welsh or British? Are they English? Um, did, what was their view of slavery? Are they involved in opposing um, abolition? Can you tell us a little bit about who owned the industry, how they saw themselves and their views? Um, I, I'll start off on that one, if you like. Um, I mean, a lot of the... Um, the firms that we associate with Swansea Copper had strong Cornish connections. Uh, the Vivian family certainly did, the Grenfells. Um, you know, there's a connection here with um, the, the banking sector in Cornwall and the Cornish copper ore mining sector and some of that early investment I think, transferred um, to Swansea. Um, you know, the, the, their knowledge of the Atlantic slave trade connections um, is an interesting one. I think, you know, it's rather ironic that in Swansea in the 1820s, there was um, an anti-slavery society, Swansea and Meath Anti-Slavery Society. People like um, the Vivian family, some of the major industrialists of the town were, were members of this um, and publicly were um, supporters of abolition. Um, and yet, at the same time, you know, the industry was um, very closely linked into these connections that we've been talking about. So, um, you know, I suppose from our perspective, we see the ironies of that and, and it can be difficult to kind of square that circle. Well, you know, how could they be buying copper from parts of the world where, where slavery was so 
embedded in, in the labour force. Um, and yet at the same, same time have been sort of publicly promoting um, support for our abolition. So it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to make sense, but you know, here's, here are people who were um, businessmen first. They were, you know, trying to source the most reliable supplies of copper or they were, they had their industry interests um, close at, at heart and they were, you know, really very successful at sort of establishing those links um, and trading in a way that they could, I suppose they could make sense of it. So it's a, it's a difficult picture, it's a complicated picture, but, um, you know, certainly they would have known, I think, quite well about, you know, what, what was going on in some of the, the ore producing countries of the world they were trading with. Yeah, I mean, not, sorry, I had to miss some of that because my dog was going nuts <laughs> to make me exit. But um, the, the, the thing I, I would emphasise here is that to be part of the copper industry couldn't be done on the cheap. This is an industry for really, really wealthy people. You had to be already wealthy to get to get involved. And that means that a lot of the money comes from London or perhaps it comes from Bristol, big merchant cities where capital is pooled. And um, that makes it unusual on a British scale. It makes it unusual on a Welsh scale. For instance, the Hang of Works in the 1780s was valued at £40,000. The whole business, including huge stocks of ore, which um, works had to keep on hand at all, all times. So compare that with, say, the Dowlice Iron, Iron Company, established 20 years earlier on a capital of £4,000. You can see the disparity between the initial investment in iron and what was needed to conduct a, a copper smelting business. This this is one of the most capital intensive businesses you can you, you can imagine and that demanded capital that was pulled elsewhere and pulled it and, and and pulled into south wales there's no way you could accumulate that for amount of capital purely from within a welsh a welsh context but copper smelting is big business and it involves people who have connections that are very very extensive indeed where did the profits go then this is an industry that generates significant wealth. What happened to it? Well, the the, the profits are, are going to a, to a wide variety of people in a wide variety of places as 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 well. Some of the people who are involved in the early stages of the of the indus, of the industry are are London London capitalists. They're connected with big um, chartered companies in the in the city in the city of London. Other capitalists are from the Bristol region. I'm thinking here of uh, the founders of the White Rock Works in the in the Lower Swansea Valley, whose name just briefly briefly escapes me. But they are people who are already engaged in um, in mining in Cornwall, in metal manufacturing in the Bristol region, in investment in slave expeditions to in in in, in the Atlantic world. So we're looking at circuits of, of of capital here that are very very extensive and often very diverse. I would say though that I think certainly in the early stages of the the industry. So we, we haven't really dated this, have we? But you know, um, seventeen seventeen first copper works opens on the, the Swansea River. Um, so it's there's quite a full story in the eighteenth century to be told. But I think that some of the early firms um, at uh, Langevella, White Rock, um, that you know they were having to reinvest an awful lot of the, what they were making. Um, because they, they went through a phase of expansion. They started off just with the smelting, sites for smelting copper, but they began to expand in, in sort of manufacturing um, plant as well. So they were opening, um, you know, mills and um, equipping them with water powered hammering equipment initially. Um, so I think when we talk about profits i think you know it's not until a bit later really when you get into the late 18th and early 19th century that um some of the wealth being being generated was was finding its way perhaps into the really into the pockets of the the owning families and you know becoming a bit more conspicuous because you know swansea 
It's one of these copper smelters. Um, some of them, you know, built themselves estates, Singleton Park being one of them. Um, and, you know, there, there was a certain, a certain amount of conspicuous wealth on, on the part of the, the, the richest members of the industry, certainly. Um, but I think that took a while to come through and it's the story of lots of um, sectors of British industry, isn't it? That it takes a few generations sometimes for um, those levels of wealth really to become evident. So you've painted a picture of an industry that was diverse in its markets. Um, you know, it, copper has been used for all kinds of different things and linked to industrial growth, which should have protected um, the industry really you know if you've got many different customers you should be okay so wh when does when does the story of Swansea Copper start to go into decline and, and I suppose more importantly why? Well well we try we try and cover this quite extensively in the book and I think one one of the things um, one of the important things really for us was to tell the story of its growth but also to tell the story of you know what happened in the latter stages and um, what really struck me was just what a long story that decline actually is, because I think you can start to see the cracks um, appearing, you know, as early as the late 1860s um, with the development of smelting and large scale ore mining overseas. Uh, and you already find Swansea copper smelters having difficulty in securing um, supplies of ore on the terms that they want, um, finding it difficult to um, pay the rents on their sites and asking landowners for rent rebates. Um, you start to see them diversifying into other types of smelting and from the 1860s onwards some of them start smelting other metals like zinc for example to um, offset some of the difficulties they were experiencing in copper. Um, and, you know, once we get into the 1880s then, I think, you know, a whole new level of problems start to emerge when you get the, the really um, dramatic growth of the American copper industry with large open scale mining, um, smelting in situ, you know, done at much lower cost. Um, suddenly, you know, the rug is pulled out really from under the, the feet of the Swansea smelters. And I think they start to realise at that point that, you know, there's no going back, that, you know, something fundamental is shifting in the global copper industry. Um, and the first big casualty really was Pasco Grenfell and Sons, uh, which went into liquidation in 1890. Um, and many of the other firms started to merge and um, try and find ways of, of keeping things going. Um, but eventually, you know, they have to you know, admit defeat and uh, um, give up the, the smelting of copper on the Swansea Valley. Uh, and that happens in 1924. Um, although manufacturing continues for a number of decades after that. So I think, you know, the, the story of the end of Swansea copper actually takes about a hundred years, I would argue, from about the late 1860s through to about the 1960s when we get um, large scale site clearance of derelict work sites in the Lower Swansea Valley. Um, so what's interesting there is, of course, you know, it's an industry in Welsh terms that's very early to industrialise, beginning of the 18th century. It's also very early to de-industrialise. And a lot of the problems are things like toxic waste, um, what you do with derelict industrial buildings. You know, these things were, were were being faced in Swansea sort of by the middle of the 20th century, um, probably a little bit before they were being faced in, in other parts of industrial Wales and industrial Britain. No, I think that's that's absolutely correct. And I think that, that raises the question of, of whether we're looking at decline or we're looking at successful adaptation. Because you you could argue that the that the that the movement of capital out from copper smelting into new processes like like zinc manufacture is not a sign of defeat. It's a sign of uh, of uh, of being nimble. I think the the key to understanding all of this is 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 coal because the Welsh process is so coal heavy. 
because it's so demanding in, in terms of the coal it, it, it consumes. As soon as you can start to save on coal, well, Swansea is going to become less and less important because Swansea's trump card is coal. Now, there's a really good source for understanding this, and it's by a, uh, a French metallurgist, Frédéric Leplay, and he publishes in the, eight, in the, the 1840s a 500-word book book, 500 page book, I should say, that's exclusively devoted to the Welsh process. And he describes there are 10 constituent parts of the, of the Welsh process. Now, that's an awful lot of coal. But even as he's writing in the 1840s, there are people who are trying to condense that process. And they do so very successfully into, say, three or four stages. So if you go from 10 stages to three or four stages, all of a sudden, the rationale for smelting copper at Swansea, where there's abundant coal, starts to starts to shrink. Uh, the Welsh process can be internationalised, and that's what happens in the in the 1840s and the 1850s. The Welsh process um, is carried by Welsh furnacemen to say South Australia. And they don't use coal, they just use wood. They use the same reverberatory furnaces as they were accustomed to in the lower Swansea Valley or in the Neath Valley, but they just adapt to the, lo to the local environment in Australia, where there's still at that time abundant wood to be burned. So the, the trump card of Swansea, its, uh, its use of coal in, in kind of gargantuan quantities, um, ceases to be a trump card in the second half of the 19th century. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, um, you know, the firms in Swansea are well aware of this as well. And, you know, there were attempts being made, um, you know, within the, the firms in the Swansea area to to try and make make their processes more coal efficient and, and cheaper. Um, and what, one of the things that um, I suppose we've done in this book is that we have tried to look at, you know, not just the big um, owners of the the firms, but also to get inside those firms and look at the work of people like agents and uh, managers and the people who are actually trying to make the technology work on a day to day basis. And, um, you know, I came across an example of um, a manager working at the Cape Copper Works in Britain Ferry in the 1890s. So this very period, really, when, you know, the, the industry was, was feeling this growing sense of competition and he and he was you know, very innovative in trying to patent new methods of, or new adaptations to the Welsh process to cut out some of the more costly stages, you know, to make it cheaper, to make it quicker, uh, and to make it more competitive ultimately. So we shouldn't, I don't think we should see the, the Swansea firms, as Chris has said, as being sort of, um, you know, immune or blind to what was happening. They, they were trying to adapt and they were trying to kind of, um, make adjustments in, in the face of this, these kind of changing technologies and changing situations. But ultimately, you know, because they were so sort of wedded to these costly coal technologies, um, it was very difficult for them to kind of break away and um, completely change the way they did things. I'm going through the questions on the chat that we haven't covered yet, but feel free everyone to, to add more questions. Um, Rhys David has asked about the relationship between Swansea and other copper ore areas in Britain beyond Cornwall, uh, Great Orm or, or Anglesey, um, you know, in, in Wales. Is, is there a relationship there? Are they part of Swansea's supply chain? Yes, very, very much so. Um, I mean, Anglesey in particular was a very important player. So copper ore was discovered um, in large quantities um, in the late 18th century and, you know, briefly was a hugely important supplier for um, the Swansea smelting firms. It also brought the very powerful figure of the Anglesey solicitor Thomas Williams into um, the, um, the Swansea copper industry. You know, he went into partnership um, with smelting firms on the Swansea River um, and changed, I suppose, the, the dynamic briefly around the period of the, the late 18th century. And it did sort of break the reliance to some extent on Cornwall, um, which I think, the, you know, the Swansea smelters were quite pleased about. They, they don't, you know, spent a lot of time looking and trying to source other supplies of copper ore and not be over-reliant on, on Cornish supplies. 
Um, so yes, other British sources like that, I think were, were very important. Um, Andrew Davis has asked that William Ashworth in his recent revisionist book, Industrial Revolution, the State, Knowledge and Global Trade argues that the state of the role of the state was crucial in nurturing British manufacturing through state regulation and protectionism. To what extent did the copper industry benefit from any tariff regulation or other state measures? Well, I, th I think the, the copper industry benefits in a couple of ways. The first is that the, the state is a major consumer of copper and the principal way in which copper is consumed by the, by the time of the American Revolution is in the copper bottom of ships. And most of the British Navy and indeed other navies are, are coppered very, very quickly from the 1770s, 1780s onwards. So the state is a massively important uh, consumer of copper. We need to think of it in that way. The other way in which we can think about the state is as an agency that, that governs tariffs. And the tariff system is really, really important from the, from the vantage point of Swansea because in the 1820s, as part of a general um, program of liberalisation of international trade on the part of the British state, the tariff barriers that had hitherto protected Cornish mine producer didn't and given them a advantage in the supply of ore, those tariff advantages begin to be wiped out. And that is what opens up the globalization of the, of the supply chain. That makes it possible to invest in Cuba, to start to bring in ores from, from Chile and eventually from Australia and Southern Africa, which happens in the 1840s and the 1850s. So the, the, so the state is really something that facilitates the globalization of Swansea copper in the mid 19th century. Perhaps we can say something about what happens afterwards. There's been a few questions about to what extent people within the city um, know about copper, but also maybe beyond Swansea as well. I mean, someone's mentioned in, in their community of uh, Kumavon, I think it was, you know, copper's important, but we call this Swansea copper, you know, and is that focusing it on the city rather than, you know, the Swansea valleys, uh, you know, as a, as a larger entity? Yeah. Do, so, do, do, sorry, do people in Swansea remember copper, do you know, and, and also, I suppose, how should we remember it? I mean, it's left a, fig a physical legacy, um, and it was a physical legacy that was you know, deeply polluted for, for a long time. And, and I suppose also, what are the attitudes of the local authorities to this as well? Sorry, that was lots of different questions. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the, the, the first one, perhaps, which, which is about um, what, what, does, what does Swansea mean? And contemporaries refer to the Swansea district, and that is actually something that encompasses um, far more than Swansea. It starts at Cumavon in the east and stretches as far as Llanethley in the, in the west. So in sort of broad terms, it's quite a confined area, but within that confined area, they're nestling individual pockets of copper production, which are in themselves important. And Cumavon was one of those, a, a thriving copper producing settlement in the in the 1840s, where the, as, as, as our sort of uh, question su suggests, there are, there are street names that very, that very obviously reference the existence of a, of a copper industry. Yeah, I mean, and in terms of sort of public awareness of copper, you know, this is a, a really good question, a really important question. And I think one where, you know, there's a, a sort of a developing story to tell, because I think certainly, you know, um, in the period immediately following the, um, the, the ending of the industry, really, so I'm talking about from maybe the yeah, the 1960s onwards, I think initially there was very little interest in um, Swansea's role and the fact that the industry had been such an important um, global player for 200 years. Um, there wasn't in that time, I don't suppose in Britain, you know, the same level of interest in the value of industrial buildings as there is now, you know, the whole notion of industrial heritage, I think, hadn't really taken root at that time. Um, and so, you know, the, the instinct of, I think the, the local authorities and people living in the lower Swansea Valley was, 
they didn't really want to see sort of derelict industrial ruins and blackened hillsides, um, reminding them of the, you know, the, this industry that, that was no more. I mean, it's all very well living in the shadow of a, a polluting industry if it's, if it's providing jobs and generating wealth. But as soon as that stops, um, you know, it's not offering you anything. So um, the Lower Swansea Valley project, which was inaugurated um, in the 1960s, a uh, partnership between Swansea Council, the university, community groups, really um, very effectively uh, redeveloped that whole site. Um, the, most of the surviving industrial buildings were, were bulldozed, um, a lot of landscaping and replanting of trees took place, which produced a much greener and pleasant environment uh, than was there before. But of course, what, what was lost really was the, the, the sort of the physical uh, remnants of the industry. Um, and only really a very small fragment now remains um, around the, the Havod Norva site which is near the park and ride in Swansea, for, for those of you who are familiar, just opposite the football stadium. Um, I think, um, you know, partly through the work we've been trying to do about the, you know, rediscovering the significance of the industry, um, there's been a kind of a resurgence of interest um, more recently in the value of that site. And I think Swansea Council has become more, more aware perhaps of the, um, you know, the value of using heritage land regeneration to put something back into that area. Um, and through the work of um, some very enthusiastic friends groups and volunteer groups, there's an, actually a lot happening now in the, the Copper Quarter. Um, my colleague Alex Langlands at Swansea is, um, is leading the university side of that partnership currently. Um, people may be aware of the, um, the plans to develop the, one of the existing remaining buildings, um, the laboratory building at Morva, um, in partnership with the Pandarian Distillery Company um, to open that as a visitor centre. Um, of course, it's, there is a link with the whisky industry, given that um, copper was such an important um, part of the production of distilling vessels for, for pr the production of whisky. Um, so in a sense, it's a, it's a very good sort of way of showcasing the connection and um, hopefully putting some much needed new investment back into that part of Swansea. Do you think there's a danger at sanitising the, the legacy of the industry? I mean, you can look at some nice buildings, but you don't see the horror of what was working inside them, like the links to the slave trade, the pollution it caused. I mean, that, that's a really good question. And I think that's where we have to <laughs> try and make sure that we have some input into the, the kind of interpretation and um, visitor information that's provided on site. Um, you know, because as, as we've, we try to tell in the book, you know, it's, it's a very complicated story. There are winners and losers and, you know, it goes over, on over a very long period. So, you know, it's not about, I don't think, trying to kind of glorify or sanitize or or celebrate um, copper in a, in a simple sense. But I think it is important to try and, you know, give people who live in that part of Swansea, you know, a sense that they live somewhere that's very unique and very distinctive. And I think it can be a, an important sense of local identity. Uh, and we're really missing out if we don't um, promote that and we don't do something to um, bring that really back into public consciousness. Our hour is at an end, so perhaps I could just ask a final question. How would you sum up then Swansea's um, global copper history? Can it be reduced to a soundbite or is that a trite question? Well, I was, I was, I was just going to say we've, we've summarised it in 200 pages. <laughs> <laughs> can, it, can it be summarised in, in, in a short, shorter version? Um, I, th I think... I think Louise, Louise pointed us in a, in a very good direction earlier on when she said it, 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 it begins very early and endures, which is to say that the first uh, glimmerings of a copper industry in Britain, um, not, not at the outset focused on Swansea, can be dated to the, to the 1680s. And it is a developmental arc that um, lasts over 200 years. So 
if we have to think about British industrialization, the contribution of Swansea to that story is we need to think of really quite attenuated processes that stretch out over long periods of time. This isn't the kind of flash in the pan story. It's about uh, the slow accumulation of capital, the development of technology over quite a long period of time. Now, I know you asked for one sentence, that was probably about eight, but <laughs> that's where I'd leave it. Louise? Yeah, I mean, I think that that is a key, a key point to end on. But, and, but also, I think it, it explains to some extent why, why it hasn't attracted more attention, because it's, you know, it's a slow, slow burn, a slow development, isn't it, copper? Um, you know, it's not a, a dramatic story of, you know, sudden boom and dramatic bust. Um, and it, it gets easily overshadowed by perhaps um, other more alluring <laughs> tales of industrialization that follow that, that kind of pattern. But what it has that's, that is really important is this, this genuine global reach going east and west, you know, from Asia to the Atlantic to South Australia, um, pivoting around this, this region in South Wales, which was coal rich um, and managed to very successfully um, become this centre of, of a global story. Um, you know, it, it is a very, a very important um, thing to know about, I think, in a Welsh context, but also in a British context too. Thanks. So the book is called uh, Swansea Copper, A Global History, uh, published by uh, John Hopkins University Press. There is a link with a discount code on your Eventbrite email, although someone said it's not uh, working properly. So we're going to double check that and we'll email everybody who registered uh, today um, with the link again and, and, the, and the code. Um, I'm going to finish off by passing back to Ian, um, the chairman of Xavier. Um, but at the bottom, you have a little reactions um, uh, icon. And if you could uh, give our two speakers uh, a, a round of applause um, and thanks for entertaining us and educating us this morning. Jachamar. Excellent. Thanks very much, Martin. Um, well, on behalf of everyone, I'd like to extend a grateful thanks once again to Martin for chairing today's event and to Louise and Chris for offering us such fascinating insights into this brilliant new publication. Uh, many thanks also to you, the audience, for your comments and questions via chat. Grateful thanks for the organisers, James, Darren and Sean for helping in this. As I mentioned at the start, I'm pleased to say that if you've missed any of our previous online events, uh, or if you'd like to listen to them again, um, links to our very own Clava YouTube channel containing recordings of them all are available via the Clava website. The recording of today's event will also be uploaded uh, then in the near future, so keep a lookout for that. Um, Clava's next online event will be linked to our annual AGM on the 5th of December. Uh, details of this will be emailed out to members and publicised on our website and Twitter feed. Also, if you're not yet a Clava member, I do hope you'll consider joining our society. Details of how to subscribe can be found on our website. And one final thing, um, South Wales Record Society are about to host their own, their own online annual lecture. James um, will put the details and Zoom link for this into the chat facility if anyone is interested in joining. SWRS have asked us to say they, that you would be most welcome. It only remains for me to say thank you uh, once again for your support and we look forward to welcoming you back to more online events in the near future. Thanks very much. Thank you.